Hello everyone, my name is Eddie Joe. I'm an intensive care physician who basically makes a living off of resuscitating patients who are in shock and who are hypotensive. And this particular lecture is going to be discussing fluid responsiveness and mean arterial pressure. Fluid responsiveness could also be used as, uh, could also be interchanged with volume responsiveness. Please bear with me as I'm going to try to do this on one take and try to try my best to explain this to you in a way that's understandable. Today, actually, as you could probably see there, is May 3rd, 2020. And I'm doing this on my iPad with my Apple Pencil. So if you hear that tapping sound, it's just that I'm writing. I apologize if it's bothersome or inconvenient. But first, let's, let's actually define what fluid responsiveness means, okay? And it is defined as an increase in stroke volume. And we're going to go over what stroke volume is. But these are things that you should just take notes on so that you can look them up from better resources than me. But it is an increase in stroke volume uh, greater than or equal to 10 to 15 percent, depending on the study you read, after a passive leg raise or a uh, volume challenge. Sorry, as I write this out, the volume challenge is usually. Uh, 250 to 500 cc's. There's also something called a mini fluid challenge with 100 cc's. Uh, again, I won't get into all that, all that nitty gritty detail about all this. And the reason why this is all important as I just move on to the next thing is that we take care of sick patients in the intensive care unit and we give fluids to a lot of patients in the intensive care unit. In taking care of these patients, we have various tools at our disposal to help determine what their volume status is. That includes a physical exam, a history, as well as hemodynamic parameters. The first thing that we check on everybody is the BP, their blood pressure. Why? Because it's easy to put a cuff on a patient's arm, cycle the blood pressure, and depending on the number, we are either happy or sad. And sometimes we are indifferent. But it is the first thing that we need to do and the most accessible thing because we can't quite put a cardiac probe on everybody's chest immediately or float a swan immediately. And this is done by putting a blood pressure cuff, as I mentioned, on the patient's extremity. Hopefully it is the correct size. And then we go ahead and we cycle the blood pressure. And then we are get given a uh, systolic blood pressure and a diastolic blood pressure. This is not a division, but we get a map in the middle, mean arterial pressure. And there is an equation for mean arterial pressure, which we all know and we've been taught over and over, which is two times the diastolic blood pressure listed there, plus the systolic blood pressure, and all this over the number three. And this is what we're taught in school. This is what we're taught in training of what the mean arterial pressure is. But before I move on to the definition that I really wanna show you about the mean arterial pressure, we need to take something into account about this mean arterial pressure. And it's something that I've discussed before on my videos. And I think that you should take some time to review. And that has to do with the fact that the vast majority of the blood pressure cuffs that are oscillometric, the vast majority of the blood pressure cuffs that are in our hospitals in the United States run based off of this type of technology called oscillometric technology. Please go ahead and look this up so you can better understand how this works. But when you are in training, whether it's nursing school, PA school, medical school, you learn to uh, determine somebody's systolic and diastolic blood pressure based on the quartz cough sounds. And of course, the first sound you hear is the systolic blood pressure. And then the last sound you hear is the diastolic blood pressure. And those give you exact numbers. Well, exact enough, because you, you know, they're not exact on your ears. But again, that's a different story, because you end up writing down whatever you want. Okay, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go away from that now. But when you have the oscillometric technology, you know, the one that's hooked up directly to the monitor, that pump, that, that blood pressure cuff actually gives this type of oscillation that looks like this. Again, this is not exact, but, what the machine realizes is what's the point of the largest amplitude of this oscillation. And that is equal to the mean arterial pressure. 
The thing that many people fail to understand is that the systolic blood pressure and the diastolic blood pressure are computer generated numbers. They are not exact numbers. And that's why when people go ahead and they, you know, get off the cuff, the systolic blood pressure and the diastolic blood pressure and try to plug it into this equation right here, the numbers don't make sense. Okay. At least on the monitor is what I mean. That being said, what's accurate here is the mean arterial pressure, because this is what's actually calculated by the oscillometric devices. Now, now that that's said, we can move on to the next thing I wanted to talk about, which is the other equation that we should know for the mean arterial pressure. And that is that the mean arterial pressure is equal to the cardiac output times the systemic vascular resistance plus the CVP central venous pressure. For the sake of simplicity here, I am going to get rid of CVP. Why? Because in somebody who's a spontaneously breathing patient, such as you and I right now at this time, CVP is equal to zero. So that will facilitate math. Okay, that makes sense. Oops, that didn't work out properly. Let's fix this. All right, getting back to looking at the mean arterial pressure. This is affected by cardiac output. And so cardiac output is equal to heart rate times stroke volume. And now you can see how uh, volume responsiveness starts to play into this. As I mentioned up above, uh, patients who are fluid responsive or volume responsive is defined as an increase in the stroke volume greater than or equal to 10 to 15 percent after a volume challenge. So that's why stroke volume increase leads to a cardiac output increase, if this stays the same. Uh, it's just simple math at the end of the day. So some of the things we need to consider when we're looking at the cardiac output, starting off with the heart rate, is if somebody's too tachycardic or an AFib with RVR, for example, it doesn't give enough of a chance for the stroke volume excuse me, for the stroke volume to adapt appropriately because you can't actually fill the left ventricle because it's going too fast. Okay, so that's why you need to keep your heart rate under control. That's why there are studies where they use drugs such as Esmolol in patients who were uh, very tachycardic in the case of septic shock to try to decrease the heart rate so that the stroke volume would therefore increase because you'd have better filling and therefore lead to improved cardiac output. But, you know, those are some studies that, that have happened in the past, and I recommend you look at them yourself. But moving along to talking more about the, the stroke volume, we need to consider three things when you're looking at the stroke volume. And it is affected, <clears throat> excuse me, by the preload, the contractility, and afterload. I apologize for my bad handwriting. That's just who I am. I can't change that right now. Okay. So carrying along, sorry, I just got a text message there. You need to make sure that somebody for them to have an appropriate uh, stroke volume, that they have sufficient preload, that they have sufficient contractility and that their afterload is not too high. If their afterload is uh, too high, then in that case, um, the stroke volume is not going to be able to be forced out. And then there are other, other factors that play into all this, you know, in the case of uh, decreased stroke volume from preload, there are things like hypocalcemia, hypo or hy hyperkalemia, hypothermia, hypoxia that all decrease the stroke volume. With regards to uh, contractility, you know, you could just have a bad heart to begin with. Uh, hypoxia and hyperkalemia also affect the contractility and other things that as I mentioned before have to do with afterload could also affect the stroke volume and what you typically want the stroke volume to be there are different numbers depending on where you look uh, based on the sexes for example in males it is between 66 to 148 and in females is 62 to 110 now, these numbers, again, depending on where you look, they could be completely different. So moving back over here, I already talked about how 
cardiac output is equal to heart rate times stroke volume. And I covered the heart rate, I covered the stroke volume. But now let's go to the rest of the equation, which is MAP is equal to cardiac output times systemic vascular resistance. And systemic vascular resistance, generally speaking, is depending on where you look, between 800 to 1200. Sometimes you might see this being 900 to 1400. It's all different depending on where you look. But systemic vascular resistance is, you know, as you can imagine, the vascular resistance that is seen throughout the rest of the body. Um, and so things that cause a decreased systemic vascular resistance is obviously sepsis and septic shock because it vasodilates. Okay, in addition to that, you could consider hyperthermia to be it, anesthesia to do it, uh, medications such as uh, nitrates to do it. So, you know, the, the SVR is not going to be changed by IV fluids per se. All in all, we give IV fluids to increase the MAP, but giving IV fluids just arbitrarily and them not causing a change whatsoever in the cardiac output means that you're over resuscitating a patient, that you're actually causing problems in that patient. And there are a number of issues that, that are caused by too much fluids. Those issues could include problems in the lungs, where people develop pulmonary edema. And right now I'm just talking off the cuff a little bit. You could also have a decreased compliance because of this. And, um, you know, patients become tachypneic, use more energy in doing so. There are also issues with the heart, which, inc which include decreased uh, contractility, which ends up being like a diastolic dysfunction type pathology. In addition to that, um, patients could also have issues with conduction. You could also have problems with your liver where you have congestion. You can have problems with your kidneys where, um, where you could also have congestion of your kidneys, uh, increased intra-abdominal pressure. Uh, in the case of the GI tract, you could develop things such as ileus, uh, malabsorption, and you could also uh, have bacterial translocation. I don't even know why I'm trying to write this because you obviously can't read this. Boo, bad job, Eddie. Please don't give me a dislike because of that. And studies have shown that only about 50% of patients who are septic actually are responsive to fluids. The other 50% of the fluids, we just, the other 50% of patients, we just blast them and we, you know, we give them these complications. So one of the things that, you know, kind of brings light to this, to all this stuff that I'm talking about here is the study called the Fanny study, Fanny study, whatever, it was published in 2015. And it's actually linked in the description below. But what they did in this study is that they looked at 2,213 patients. It was an observational study. Um, it was an observational cohort study. What they did find is that, you know, sometimes people use different parameters to uh, see if a patient is volume responsive. That includes like CVP, passive leg raise. They look at stroke volume. They look at uh, stroke volume variation, pulse pressure variation. Things that I'm going to plan on that I'm going to plan on covering, you know, on this channel in the upcoming weeks. But what they found is that 42.7 percent of clinicians didn't do anything whatsoever to assess for fluid responsiveness or to see if, uh, you know, if there was any change in hemodynamic parameters. And that's pretty disappointing because this is all arbitrary practice of medicine. We got to be better than this, guys. And the other thing that they found that was very important and very, um, I guess, I guess uh, depressing of sorts is that patients got an IV fluid bolus, right? And they looked for some sort of response, like either BP or CVP or urine output or lactate, any of these things that we typically look for. But in this case, 49.4% of patients had a negative response. And then what did the clinicians do? They gave them another 500 cc bolus of IV fluids. That, my friends, is the Einstein definition of insanity, which is, you know, when you do the same thing, expecting different results. Because if the patients didn't respond, then why in the world would you give them another 500 cc's? That's just something that's completely bonkers to me and something that we need to be better at. 
Um, another example of, you know, going back to this equation of map is equal to um, cardiac output times, sorry, my pen just went down, times systemic vascular resistance is in the case of a patient who is in cardiogenic shock. And, you know, the first, the first knee-jerk response that we all do when somebody's hypotensive is to go ahead and give them IV fluids, right? But in the case of somebody who is in cardiogenic shock, if you actually give them, uh, if you actually give them more IV fluids, since their contractility is so poor, you actually are going to uh, overload the heart itself and you're actually going to decrease your cardiac output. And so the, the map might look better for a few moments until all that fluid kind of extravasates, but then their cardiac output's gonna get worse and they're not going to do better. They're, you're actually gonna cause them harm. As you know, in patients who are in cardiogenic shock, giving them fluids is not the right thing to do. They need things to increase their cardiac output, which includes inotropes. And in the case of SVR, because SVR tends to be high in patients who are in cardiogenic shock, they need vasodilators whether it be nitrates or some other medication to help bring down the SVR. So you want to increase your cardiac output and decrease the SVR. Again, you need to pay more attention to these parameters than to this number right here. Uh, I think that's enough for today with regards to this topic. I hope I did an okay job at least at explaining why you know, just targeting the map without looking at the components of the map or you know, why, why you shouldn't look just at the map. That's why you need to think a little bit harder. You need to do, excuse me, you need to look at cardiac output over here and you need to think about the systemic vascular resistance of this patient. And sometimes it's helpful to look at the CVP, especially in the case of patients who are volume overloaded. Although I have plenty of qualms with CVP. Anyway, I hope this video helps. Um, please hit the like button and subscribe. Have a great day. Bye.